para no quitar mi protagonismo. everybody thank you for being here again uh, what I'm going to do at, uh, at the beginning is just uh, to insist in some of the point the points I made yesterday uh, just for us to be able to uh, to have all the information together in order to uh, uh, to proceed to the next step which is the, the semantic part of my proposal <coughs> what we did yesterday was uh, what I, I did yesterday was uh, to explain the the philosophical well the philosophical motivation and the philosophical background of my approach to truth the philosophical motivation was as i told you yesterday was that uh, the the proposals uh, the proposals about the definition of truth which are available which were available in the last century were so uh, wide, so ample, so broad, that I thought that there would be something wrong in them because it, it wouldn't be possible for them, for all of them to be true at the same time. But if you look at one of them on time, you will see that all of them touch on interesting and well understood points that deserve to be done. So my proposal is, okay, so Let's forget the, the, the start points that we have had uh, towards truth in the last century and try to, to have a fresh start. And the fresh start I propose is placing ourselves in a pragmatist perspective. What I understand by pragmatism is the position that considers uh, practices, that is, what speakers do with words in real communicative exchanges as the basic fact, as the fund foundational level, that's all. This is what uh, pragmatism means in my mouth, nothing else. So this, this was the, 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 the starting point. And then, 
I said that as a pragmatist, I don't think that reality comes into portions. I assume that our communicative exchanges are part of a reality which is continuous, but uh, that for methodological reasons, it, it is sometimes advisable to divide uh, our topic into a syntactic perspective, a semantic perspective, and a pragmatic perspective. The foundational level, as I have said, is the pragmatic one. But yesterday, so, but uh, truth is, a, is such a complex notion that has distinctive features in all the three levels. So yesterday, I explained, more or less, which were the features of the truth predicate, the truth predicate, the syntactic features of the truth predicate. And I explained that the truth predicate is a, an instrument for convert, converting designations of propositions into expressions of propositions. And I said that in natural languages, we also have tools, instruments, to do the, the converse, the converse move, movement. We have also instruments to convert, to convert expressions of propositions into designations of propositions. This is what uh, I explained yesterday. Then, enough for the syntactic side. Then, let's go to the semantic part. Uh, I insisted yesterday in that I don't, I, uh, I insisted in that uh, uh, there is nothing such as a real divide between a semantic and a pragmatic perspective. So uh, uh, this is a, the, the, what belo uh, which part of our, of our proposal belongs to the semantics and which part belongs to the pragmatics is something that depends on a decision on our part. So I'm, I'm going to talk about semantics and pragmatics in a very vague way, in the sense that, I mean, we can, we can trace a frontier, but this frontier is completely artificial. <coughs> this is what follows from a pragmatist perspective. What I said yesterday is that uh, part of my pragmatism stems them, from Frege, from the Freudian principle of concept. And the, and the basic idea is that, as Frege said, uh, said, and I accept, only in the context of a whole sentence have words meaning. So one of the uh, reasons why I think why we don't have a complete and elaborated and, and deep uh, account of the meaning of truth is that, as I see it, we have cut language in, in two small portions. So the minimal portion to understand the meaning of any kind of notion, particularly of notions which are not referential, <coughs> is the whole sentence. This is what follows from the Fregian principle of uh, context. Uh, this, this idea of the elementary proposition is Carnap's terminology. Again, Carnap, when we think of Carnap, we think the, uh, of, a, of a positivist philosopher, a representationalist, verificationist, I don't know, reductionist, and so on. But even Carnap advised to look at the meaning of notions in the context of their elementary propositions. So I think that, that the first and probably the most important step in order, in order to, to get a, a, a deep understanding of how a notion work, works is identifying what is 
its elementary proposition. And my proposal is, okay, related to truth, the elementary proposition is the truth ascription. And yesterday, we saw that there are many kinds, many different kinds of truth ascription. And uh, I think that my proposal ca can explain the functioning of the truth notion in all of them, in every kind of truth ascription. So, uh, truth ascriptions are, so the, the semantic core, I insisted yesterday in the same idea, the semantic core is that, so how the, the notion of truth works? Well, I don't know. The, 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 right, uh, uh, the right question is what we do with the elementary propositions in which truth appears, in which truth occurs. So, and what we do with them? Well, part of the answer is that truth ascriptions, the complete sentences, work in natural languages as complex propositional variables. Complex propositional variables. Uh, linguists call natural language variables proforms. Proforms. We all, we all know some kind, we all know very well from, from I'm, I'm thinking of the philosophers of language. We, philosophers of language, know very well how a particular kind of proforms work. And it is the, the, the kind of pronouns. Pronouns are proforms, nominal proforms, uh, so to say. As I see it now, and you can think, I mean, I, I'm mentioning here Kaplan's treatment of pronouns. But uh, I'm not, I mean, we, we don't need to, to stick to this treatment. We can't have any other proposal. I'm, I mean, I'm not, uh, so the, the feature of my proposal uh, don't depend on Kaplan's particular account. But the idea is that, as I see it, proforms, pronouns can't be accounted for, their meaning can't be accounted for, unless we have what is called a two-factor theory of meaning. In fact, I think that to understand the functioning of any kind of notion, we need a two-factor theory, at, at least two-factor theory of meaning. But in particular, to understand proforms, that you can't understand proforms unless you have a two-factor uh, theory, because proforms, in proforms, the distinction between linguistic meaning and contextual content is very uh, sharp. What I mean is that when we use proforms, we, we will need a theory that first explains this aspect of the meaning of this word that are constant from context to context, but we also need a, 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 a part, an, an aspect of meaning that explains the differences in content from one use to another one. So, my proposal. Given that pronouns are the kind of proforms that we better know, I suggest to use, uh, to develop a theory of pro-sentences following the same lines, following the lines that have allowed us to understand pronouns. So, as I see it, I think that pronouns are used in our ordinary exchanges, as I, as I said yesterday. I take my proposal to be an empirical proposal. 
So I'm not, I'm not, uh, I mean, I think that I'm not doing armchair philosophy. I'm trying to explain what we do with our words, what we do in our uh, exchanges. So as I see it, I think that we speakers use pronouns as vehicles, so as, as instruments to directly refer to an object salient in context. So pronouns are first vehicles of direct reference. This, the, the, the word this is a pronoun. So if I say this is a computer, I'm using this, the pronoun, as a vehicle of direct reference. But a second, um, a second function that pronouns perform is being vehicle, vehicles of anaphoric reference. We can't do without instruments to refer to anaphorically refer to some other terms that have been put forward in previous acts of uh, uh, communication. So, anaphoric reference is the the kind of uh, of reference that al allows our discourse to possess unity. So if we have a, a, a big, a, a long discourse, we need to keep track of the object uh, we are talking about. And to do that, so to keep track of the same object, we use pronouns in functions of anaphoric reference. So an example is if I say, I heard about this car or this kind of car and I bought it. It is a pronoun, but it's not working as a vehicle of direct reference, but it is reaching its uh, reference by means of its anaphoric head, which is a term that uh, has uh, occurred previously in our discourse. Is it clear? I think it's, well, this is quite obvious. So, and third, and very important. <coughs> Pronouns are essential to express general thoughts. We cannot use quantifiers without having pro forms, because pro forms are the natural language counterparts of variables in artificial languages. So imagine when you think of uh, the um, predicate calculus, always together, as always, if you if you introduce a, a quantifier, you have to indicate the kind of object it is quantifying over. And to do that, we need to introduce variables. So if we didn't have variables in our artificial languages, we couldn't express generality. And the same happens in our natural languages. Well, in fact, it is the other way around, because artificial langu languages, artificial languages are just models, models that try to mimic the way in which some parts of our, of our natural discourse uh, work. Okay, so I think, I mean, I, I would like to to think that uh, you understand that pronouns perform this three kind of tasks. Well, okay. there's more question about the, the, the first uh, condition. Why direct reference? What do you mean with that? You you assume that uh, because connected with direct reference, you there is this essential loop, and I'm not. I don't need it. Okay. So okay. Yes. Yeah. No. You we'll go vehicles of reference. Of reference, but I said direct reference to distinguish between this kind of reference and anaphoric reference. Let's say that direct reference is the way in which uh, we begin our discourse. 
So the way in which our discourse is connected with, rea with reality, you know that, I mean, I hate this way of talking, but so this uh, the, the connecting discourse with the rea reality and so on. I think it's uh, metaphysically unwarranted. But the idea is sometimes we refer to objects, salient, and sometimes so we, we refer to objects, salient, and content directly in the sense that we are all of, all of, all of us, we are looking at the object, and sometimes we are just keeping track of an object to which we have referred previously. So the second kind is anaphoric reference. The first kind is direct reference. But my proposal—I mean, my proposal has all the all the complexity that it needs, but no more than that. So I'm not uh, getting committed to particular kind, particular types of theories about direct reference or I don't know. Uh, okay, causal theory of reference or whatever. So my position is compatible with any kind of theory that accounts for the referential uh, function of our terms, okay? Well, thank you. So, the, yeah. Ah, yeah, you are right. No, 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 it is not. So, so yeah, thank you very much, because this is why, for instance, yesterday I, I talked, and I'm going to talk again of, uh, of the same topic. I said exhibitive. Uh, true transcriptions instead of transparent because of the same problem because sometimes transparent uh, pop up, uh, up uh, a kind of uh, of connection that uh, is unwelcome and here you are right maybe i should say a demonstrative reference yeah right so then i think that this position about, I mean, this uh, characterization of the job that pronouns perform is quite obvious. There's nothing difficult about it, I think. Then the suggestion is, is let's try to understand plus sentences following the same lines. Okay? Well, uh, my hypothesis is the rest of proforms, so there are some proforms between pronouns and pro sentences. I said yesterday we have pro adverbs, pro adjectives, and sometimes pro attitudes. We have pro everything. The suggestion is all proforms work in more or less uh, the same way. Exactly in the same way. Well, not exactly in the same way, because as I told you yesterday, I think that you cannot disconnect syntax from pragmatics. And in natural languages, we have different kinds of terms from a grammatical point of view. We have singular terms, we have adverbs, we have sentences. In order for us to be able to perform different kinds of acts, so the kind of acts performed by pronouns, there is a, a part of the way in which they work that depend, depends directly from their category as singular terms. So if, if we move to another kind of perform, for instance, pro-adverbs, the way in which pro-adverbs work cannot be exactly the same as the way in which pronouns work, work uh, work, uh, because there is a part of the functioning of the term which depends on its grammatical category. But apart from that, the, the, the uh, tripartite distinction is more or less the same in all kind of profound. So this is what I have said here. I said pronouns refer because they are singular terms. But sentences, for instance, are not referential devices. So sentences are appropriate to express propositions, but not to refer to them. So we don't have exactly uses of direct reference or demonstrative reference and anaphoric reference. But we have function, uh, functions that 
so to say, uh, resemble at the sentential level six functions of pronouns. Okay? So let's see. <laughs> this is something that I also said yesterday. I distinguish because you, you asked me, and I distinguish between nominal sentences and sentential sentences. Nominal and sentential characterize the grammatical category, whereas sentences is a logical category, which is a prosentence. A prosentence is an expression which can inherit any propositional content. But this can be done with an expression with the category of a singular term or with an expression with the category of a complete sentence. So this is why I have made it distinction. Uh, examples. Uh, uh, nominal sentence. I can say, I reject what she said. In this case, what she said is a sentence, but it's a nominal sentence because it has the category of a singular term, a definite description. Okay? Uh, Nominal sentence again. Victoria declare, declare that she had not been there, but I did not believe it. It here is a prosentence because the content to which it anaphorically refers is the whole proposition that Victoria uh, wasn't there. Victoria wasn't there. So I refer to, the, to this complete proposition by means of it. But it has the grammatical category of a singular term. So from a logical point of view, I would say, from a logical semantical point of view, it works here as a sentence. But from a grammatical point of view, it is a pronoun, of course. And this is why I have called this kind of terms nominal sentences. But we have also sentential sentences. For instance, if I say if I say it is true, the whole sentence is a pro sentence. It doesn't have a content unless we know which is the propositional content it inherits. Or what she said is, is false, again, the complete sentence is also a pro sentence, a, a sentential pro sentence. Okay? pro -adverse. I'm not going to, to talk about pro -adverse. I mean, it's uh, the same kind of, uh, of explanation. But here, pro-sentences. I have said that uh, sentential pro-sentences cannot be used to make any kind of referential act because they don't have the appropriate grammatical category. But there are pragmatic functions that they have and that which are reflected to the, to the, to the grammatical uh, wordings that in some sense are analogous to the use of pronouns in direct reference. Which kind of uh, sentences can mimic the working of uh, pronouns in, in function of direct reference, well, what I have called exhibitive singular pro-sentences. So look at, this, uh, at, these, two, uh, at, the, at uh, these two examples. It is true that Sevilla is a beautiful city. What kind of, well, the, the second one, uh, with uh, quotation marks. Sevilla is bigger than Granada is a true sentence. What kind of use do, uh, uh, do uh, these kind of pro sentences perform? They are quite trivial because they are exhibitive in the sense that, uh, besides being a pro sentence, they uh, reproduce 
in their very wording, the sentences, the sentences by means of which, uh, of which they are, uh, they, they can express their content. So imagine that we, we place ourselves in a pragmatist setting. When would, would we uh, use plus sentences of this trivial kind? Well, my answer is, so Ramsey also answered the same way. My answer is, well, sometimes we want to put a proposition explicitly under the eyes of our audience. Sometimes I can say, okay, uh, Porto Alegre is a beautiful city. I'm just making a, uh, an assertion. Porto Alegre is a beautiful city. But sometimes I want to, I would like to uh, address your attention to the proposition in order for me to do something with it. For instance, to draw some consequences from this proposition or to um, introduce some doubt about it and so on. And then, in order to do that, I can say, okay, yes, I know. It is true that Porto Alegre is a beautiful city, but you know, it's not too big or it doesn't have too many monuments. I don't know. So what I'm doing here is something which is similar to the use of pronouns in direct reference. I'm just drawing your attention explicitly to a proposition. Sometimes it is the same it, but here it's uh, um, <clears throat> uh, well. It it can be okay. Sorry. Um, so I think you are using for sentence for it is a, it is true. You are using uh, the name. Uh, you are calling this structure sentential pro sentence. As if, as if, the whole sentence would be referring or Whatever. expressing yeah. uh, the proposition. But it seems that just the it is expressing the proposition. No. That's, that's my question. The it is a pro-sentence, too, here. It is true. The it is a pro-sentence, too, but it is not expressing the proposition, but referring to it. If you want to express the proposition, you have to ask the dummy predicate is true. Otherwise, you wouldn't have the appropriate grammatical category. I don't know if I made myself understood. So with it, it is a pro-sentence. Yes, it is. But it's a nominal pro-sentence. It. Uh, it. Just it. Okay. it. Okay. By means of which you can refer to a proposition. Okay. But if you want to express it, you have to use the appropriate grammatical category, which is the, the sentence, the complete sentence. Then you have to add, it's true. And this is why some people, for instance, uh, Christopher Williams, call it's true mm -hmm. a dummy predicate. It's a grammatical predicate, but it doesn't perform any semantic job. Okay? Just syntactic. Okay? Well, let's uh, continue. Is it clear? Yeah. It's clear. You could you could have referred. So today if if I for instance, if I say okay, uh, I don't know. Um, I don't know. I don't know what it is. Uh, I don't know a Hyundai car. I don't know what kind of car a Hyundai is. And you, you can say this. Okay. 
We're saying. I was, yeah, this by is it, it. It's, it's a, can be, can, well, in, in this case it's a percent, it's a, sorry, in this case it's a pronoun. And, but it is nothing. In, okay, yeah. This is, well, well, I hope. I understand that you are calling, you are giving, uh, you are calling it in a zoo, a sentential, uh, no. Sentential percentage. percentage. You are you are nominating. That's your uh, nomination of this kind of sentence. Yeah, my terminology. Your terminology because your because terminology. there is a problem. I mean, and somebody yesterday, I think Luis yesterday asked about uh, this. And if you look at the bibliography of uh, presententialism, there is different ways in which people call some uh, expressions prose sentences. And sometimes, some of them, for instance, Dorothy Glover, uh, considers that prose sentences are just the subject or to what I call a sentential prose sentence. So for Dorothy Glover, the prose sentence is, the pro -sentence is what she said or it, whereas for Christopher Williams, the pro-sentence is, it is true, or what she said is true. And I think that there is no uh, uh, sub philosophical substance behind this distinction, and that we can have both, because the notion of pro-sentence represents or, or characterizes the functioning, the semantic functioning, whereas when I say nominal or sentential, I'm characterizing the grammatical category of the expression. So they are two different things. Okay? I don't know if I understand so here, but the problem with it is true, it's perhaps related with uh, um, the peculiarity of English, because in, in our language we wouldn't use no. a pronoun there, you see. So it, it's okay, not yeah. important in this context. And this is why I have said yes and no. Uh, Sophia said this it is the same that other, uh, the, the pro-sentence in other the nominal. the nominal. And I said yes and no. It can be, but not always. And here, it is what linguists call an expletive use, which means nothing. It's just a, a, a grammatical way in which we have a subject for the operator, nothing else. So here, I wouldn't say that it is a percentage. It is a resource of English to keep grammaticality. In Spanish, we would say, es verdad, without the it, because the it here doesn't perform any semantic job. This is why I said, it depends. It sometimes is a percentage, but not in this case. It's clear now. Yeah. So you, you could say that uh, the main idea of what you're trying to explain is also being really applicable to world theory. For example, it, the statement, it is considered to be a pro-sentence or a pronoun. It is true only if the concept, the context of this is true. No, if the context made made, uh, sorry, if the context makes it to have a propositional content. I'm a pragmatist, so I'm saying that it has a stable linguistic meaning. I don't know what it is, quite empty, it. But its content depends on context. So it, the word, would act as a pro-sentence if, in the context of its use, we are, by means of it, referring to a propositional content. So in this case, it works as a pro-sentence. Uh, just let me cut the, the it, I think it's making trouble. Only because it is... Take it out. Yes, okay. It is, Forget it. English. It's not, it's, so, uh, 
Who is praised the, the, the sentence that Sevilla is a beautiful city is true. Is yes, true. yes, yes. So but it is not but I, I, yeah, of course. <laughs> but I wanted to to put this kind of example because sometimes people discuss whether truth is an operator or a predicate, and I say none of them. Truth is a concept that can occur in sentences as part of an operator, as in this case. So this is the favorite, uh, a, a philosopher's favorite. It is true that no normal person uses it is true that in real communicative exchanges. It's quite artificial, but you know, all of us know, that it is one of, of the philosopher's favorites of the way in which philosophers discuss the notion of truth. That I, I was thinking as well, that when you said we, we use this when we want to present the audience, uh, I think this is a very unusual way to use, because that's in, in context of, of class or... or exactly, exactly. Or so. Well, I, sometimes I say that um, this kind of exhibit is for sentences. Only, only find that I use in philosophical books, <laughs> no normal person used them. They use is quite marginal, and for me, it's quite uh, uh, surprising that philosophers has uh, philosophers uh, have used them as the paradigm uh, to develop their theories of truth. They are quite trivial uses. Not they, they are not real uses. Okay. I don't think that should matter because, I mean, in linguistics they make this distinction between performance and competence, and it's not, it's actually not statistical. <laughs> uh, it's, it's just, intuitively, it's true that Sevilla is a beautiful city, it's perfectly acceptable setting, it's perfectly welcoming, and for linguists, for a lot of them, that's the only thing that matters. It's, yeah, it agrees with our, our unconscious knowledge of what an English sentence should be. So it's perfectly valid data, mm -hmm. even even if it's never used. Okay, yes, that's true. Um, no, what I mean is that if we focus just in this kind of example, it's very difficult to develop a substantial theory of truth, because this in this kind of examples, the notion of truth is quite idle. They are perfectly grammatical sentences, okay, but they don't show the the real job that the notion performs. Okay. I am not comfortable uh, with <laughs> your distinction between nominal and sentence. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> so let me. Okay. But we can discuss that after. Yeah, because... Okay. Huh? Okay. okay, so what I'm saying is that um, so one of the... Uh, okay, so if uh, we seriously think that um, uh, truth ascriptions work as raw sentences, we should, uh, we should be able to find in their uses the same kind of uses that we have when we have pronouns. So if we are characterizing pro sentences and pronouns as kind of pro forms, it is, okay, it is, uh, uh, well, it, it should be expected that there are some coincidences in the way in which these two kind of expressions work. So what I'm saying is, okay, prosentences can't work in exactly the same way in which pronouns work because sentences are not names, but there are some similarities. So when we use a pronoun in functions of direct or demonstrative reference, this is a book, the kind of act I'm performing is addressing, directing the audience attention towards 
this object. So I can do the same with pro uh, with propositions. I cannot point at them because they are not physical objects, but I can put them under the, the eyes of my audience. How? Okay, using a sentence with this content. So if I say, okay, yes, that Porto Alegre is a, is a beautiful city, is true. I'm not just saying Porto Alegre is a beautiful city. What I'm doing is saying that Porto Alegre is a beautiful city and warning you, okay, look at this proposition, that I'm going to say something else about it. So in this sense, I think that exhibited, what I have called, exhibited singular sentences are the analogous of pronouns in uses of direct reference. That's all. This is a proposal. Uh, 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 second, we should be able to find also uses of prosentences analogous to the use of pronouns in, a, in an aphoric reference. So they are, in fact, sentential proforms, sentential prosentences are always sentences in uses of something like anaphoric reference. And this is why yesterday I said that truth ascriptions, an act of truth ascription, is always a second order act. It needs another act, an assertive act, that put forward the content that afterwards is going to be inherited in the act of truth ascription. So, every act of uh, truth ascription is an act in which a pro-sentence, a sentential pro-sentence, is being used in a sense similar to the uses of pronouns in cases of anaphoric reference. More or less, this is I mean, this is some similar, there is some similarity. I'm just, I mean, I'm, this is a proposal, my proposal, the way in which we can understand pro-sentences following the lines uh, of, of our uh, classical analysis of pronouns. And third, generalization. Truth cannot be redundant, among other things, because without the truth apparatus, we wouldn't be able to express general thoughts about propositions. For instance, I, I'm going to, to comment these examples too, but now let me say something. Uh, this is gamma and the consequence sign and uh, uh, what well, another example I mean I will also I'm, I'm simpler one. The principle of excluded cell. If I say P or no P, how can I translate this principle into English? A way of doing it is saying, okay, if you have, so all, it always happens, it always happens that either one proposition or its negation is true. What uh, uh, the notion of uh, what uh, does uh, the notion of truth add in my rewarding in my translation of this principle into English? The answer is 
Nothing. This principle is a generalization, of course. I'm talking about any kind of proposition, but in a, in, a, in a language like the language of propositional calculus in which we have a big amount of propositional variables, the truth predicate is idle. Because to express general thoughts about propositions, I can use the apparatus of, of propositional variables together with quantifiers. But in natural languages, we don't have the, let's say, the enough supply of propositional variables, simple propositional variables, in order to express general thought. So we build up general, ex, uh, general sentences that, uh, whose con uh, uh, which have as, uh, as their content generalization over propositions using the truth apparatus. OK? Then, let's go. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, but, but uh, wait, uh, I mean, okay. Uh, I can say um, generalization. Imagine that I want to say that. So imagine uh, the content of this uh, sentence. If President Rajoy says something, or everything that President Rajoy says, is ratified by Soraya, uh, which is the vice president. This is a, a, way, a, a, this is a, a way of quantifying over propositions. And to quantify over propositions, we use plus sentences here. Something and it refer to propositions. So, sometimes we want to say things like this one. But sometimes we want to say that we will, or somebody will, accept everything that is asserted by somebody else. So the way of doing it is saying everything the Pope uh, says is true. What does it mean? It means that if Pope Francis says something, I will endorse it. Am I referring to particular propositions? The answer is no. I'm not referring to any particular proposition. I'm referring to any kind of proposition that Francis Pope, sorry, uh, Pope Francis uh, asserts. Okay? So, if we want to present or endorse or reject or whatever, Facts of propositions, we need means of propositional generalization. And truth is one of, uh, of these means. Without the truth apparatus, we couldn't. So we wouldn't be able to express things like the uh, principle of, of excluded, uh, excluded middle, for instance. Okay? Or the idea that everything that follows from a true, if I say, Everything that follows from a true uh, set of premises is true. I would ask, okay, if this is a set of premises and I can uh, assert uh, the first one, the second one, till the, the last one, then if proposition mm -hmm. alpha follows from this uh, uh, set, then I'm allowed to assert alpha. I can, exp I can express this general thought inside the language of the meta theory of the, of the first predicate calculus. But if I want to translate it into, into Spanish or into English or into Portuguese, I need to use the notion of truth. Because the notion of truth is a notion that allows me to making some kind of uh, generalizations over propositions, OK? So then I have examples of uses of plus sentences that uh, in some sense resemble the uses of pronouns in, in 
functions of a direct reference, also in anaphoric reference, and also in generalization. Uh, so, yeah, but uh, yeah, just uh, just a little a little thing, and I can I can I can and I can uh, uh, stop here. Okay. Something that I, I mean, uh, I wonder why in natural languages we have different kinds of pro sentences. For instance, pro sentences in which the truth um, uh, term is part of an operator, uh, pro sentences in which we have quotation marks, pro, pro sentences that are not um, uh, exhibited but blind, he spoke truly or she said nothing but the truth, and so on. And the answer is, okay, each, each one of these types is appropriate to perform a different kind of act in which truth takes part essentially. So this uh, uh, kind of, of pro forms, some of them perform uses which are similar to the uses of pronouns in, in, in function of uh, direct reference, some others not, and so on. So, but the, the hypothesis, again, is again is that we have different kinds of pro sentences because with them, we perform different kinds of acts. This is the idea. And now I can talk here, and Sophia, what was your... No, it's a general question. I already have yesterday and so when you say that you are a pragmatist and you are speaking about propositions from a pragmatist point of view yeah. it 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 puzzles me. But why? Because it seems that um, for example, a Freudian proposition in yeah. the sense of Frege, you don't need you don't need variety of speech acts. And How not? Uh, Remember, Frege says, for instance, and, and propositions can be uh, expressed. Um, so uh, wait a minute. Frege accepts it that. The same proposition can be entertained or asserted. The same proposition can be the content of two different speech acts. Yes. Only that Frege didn't uh, didn't speak uh, using this terminology. I agree, but Frege accepted a pragmatist point of view. The classical interpretation of Frege is not that one, but I think the classical interpretation of Frege is wrong. Mm -hmm. I'm a pragmatist. But Why I'm a pragmatist? So wait a minute. If I wanted to uh, define what a proposition is using Carnap's insight of um, uh, a structural, iso um, is, uh, structural isomorphism, I wouldn't be a pragmatist. This wouldn't be a pragmatist characterization. But my my way of characterizing propositions is completely pragmatist because I understand by propositions the content of act of assertion. Full stop. This is a perfect pragmatist characterization. I mean, I, I don't think that it's a perfect in the sense that it is correct. But then this is a perfectly pragmatist characterization. So are you suggesting that if we are pragmatists, we are not allowed to speak about proposition? No, but uh, Vasilis yesterday said that if you are a supreme pragmatist or a pragmatist, you, you don't need to speak about proposition. Or, or something like that. And it is it 
this uh, it is a matter of uh, debate if for example what the second Wittgenstein says about meaning as use as rules of use um, can be can be compatible with a maintenance of the discourse about propositions. But why not? I mean, I know that, for example, MacDow agrees with you, would agree with you, that the second dictation, a strong pragmatist, uh, could, could be seen as maintaining a discourse about proposition, but I'm not sure. I, I But, Sophia, we can't talk about the functioning of language without using uh, some term like proposition in the sense that we use language as an instrument for doing things. And among other things, we communicate. What we communicate are not uses, but contents. We communicate contents when we use some kind of words in some kind of act. But proposition is a technical term that is essential. Maybe we can we can change. We ma maybe we will think that we should change the notion of proposition by some other notion. But the notion of proposition cannot be, let's say, cannot be absorbed by the notion of speech acts. Different kinds of speech acts can have the same content. One often hears that in some sense Frege was a, a Platonist, huh? a Platonist, or, or something quasi-Platonic. So I think that there are two notions of truth in Frege, depending on which article by Frege you're reading. But there's a notion that the true is a, a possible referent of, of a sentence or a proposition. Then there's the other notion that truth is a property of propositions. But in either case, truth is something eternal, it's, a, it's abstract, it's outside of space and time, uh, because propositions are abstract objects, they have no space-time location, they're eternal, uh, they exist whether you think about them or not. Whereas pr for pragmatists, truth is a matter of usefulness, it's a matter of action, it's a matter of, of empirical reality. And uh, I, well, I'm sure you would agree that prima facie, Frege doesn't seem like a pragmatist. So some kind of well, work I, I has agree. To be done to but see. but tomorrow we are going to see. Uh, we are going to to focus on 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 a paragraph in which Frege expressed a, a position about truth, which is exactly like mine. What I think is that uh, saying that truth is the reference of some sentences is a technical way of uh, express, uh, it's, a, it's a technical expression. So uh, Frege was a mathematician, so she, uh, he wanted to have a, a unified theory, and then he decided that sentences work like singular terms in the sense that they have sense and reference, so they include truth value. In fact, what Frege says is that the reference on se of sentences are truth values, but not the notion of truth, which is something else. And it is true that prima facie, uh, Frege doesn't look like a pragmatist. But uh, it is because the classical interpretation of Frege has uh, sort of uh, uh, obscured some of his explicit claims. For instance, in Begrischrift, Begrischrift is a completely pragmatic work, piece of work. And I can, I mean, I can show it. So he begins saying that what we uh, have at the first, uh, at the beginning, are two kind of acts. So entertaining a proposition or asserting a proposition, and only, uh, and, and we we can abstract a notion, words, or concept when we have a whole act of assertion, uh, which he uh, represents with this. Uh, 
the judgment stroke and the and the and the, and the content stroke. So I can I mean I can I can sort of I mean I have arguments to show that Frege should be better understood as a kind of pragmatist. But you are right, and all of you are right in that the notion of the, the term pragmatism has many different senses. For instance, I wouldn't say, so my, my theory of truth is uh, built up in a pragmatist account of meaning, but I don't have a pragmatist theory of truth. I don't think that truth is usefulness. American pragmatists did, but I don't think that truth is, truth is uh, something like usefulness. My pragmatism only means that we have to look at what agents do with words in order to develop a theory that explains the functioning of this uh, notion. But that's all. But yes, Frege doesn't look like a pragmatist, prima facie. You are right, completely right. Well, some Platonist linguists are also Phrygian or quasi Phrygian, and they view language as an abstract object. And it would exist even if no one used it. But I don't. I mean, I don't. Like, I don't okay. buy this uh, interpretation of Frege. I don't buy. I think it's completely unwarranted. It has been the classical one during the 20th century, but now I'm. I mean, I, I'm working on that. I'm rereading Frege, and I think that uh, we consider Frege the father of logic and the father of the philosophy of language. But we have renounced their teachings completely. So we are. We are following Tarski and Hilbert, and not Frege. And, and, and Frege and Hilbert and Frege and Tarski have incompatible positions about what logic and language uh, are, so what kind of systems. So in some sense, I think that uh, we, we in, during the 20th century, we have interpreted Frege through the eyes of Tarski, which is uh, terrible. Mm -hmm. well, I have some comments and, and, and at least two questions. Uh, okay. okay. May I do that? Oh, okay. uh, first of all, this discussion, uh, about this discussion, I, I sympathize with the idea that Frege uh, was well aware of the pragmatic aspect of language. Of course. Uh, I only saw that. He was completely aware of that. And many, many examples. So, it is to say that although Prima Facci, the theory of truth is, Frege's theory of truth is uh, made tailored by Jude logic, he was aware of the distinction between what, what I'm doing here and what people do out of the street. So, yeah. in this sense, I think about just that. And of course, if you are trying to explain natural language, you have to focus on this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this pragmatic aspect of, of assertion. So, in this sense, we can make compatible uh, the pragmatic aspect of Bayesian theory with the theory of truth made to, uh, to logic. And here is what I'm, I'm, it leads to my, my question to you. Uh, uh, I'll start by the end. And when you said, if you would uh, like. Uh, yes, yeah, that, that one, that one. That, that, yes, yeah. that one, that yeah. one. Generalizations. And you explain the truth. Uh, uh, the truth or the use of truth as a way of generalizing uh, over sentences. That's the idea. That's over propositions. Over, over, over propositions. Over, over content of, of sentences. This is the idea. Mm -hmm. uh, but the way you said that may give the uh, idea that perhaps it's the main way you used to do that. And I came thinking different ways to generalize over content, which has nothing to do with truth. That is to say that you have to, it seems to me that you have to add something to this assertion in order for it to make sense. That something is, what are we, we just, 
are, what are we generalizing when we use this way of this uh, quantifier? Let's put this uh, yeah. this quantifier in natural language. And what we are doing is generalizing our endorsement over the content. So it's a very specific generalization. But when you, if you have that, and you haven't done this, I mean, so part of the question is, do you agree with that? And when we do that, we do that uh, when we generalize. We generalize because we are interested in one specific aspect of of our interaction, which is the truthness or the objectivity of our assertions. Mm -hmm. So this is, of course, well. Uh, it, fits, it fits very well into logic. So we see logic comes into again and kind of directing our observation of the natural language. So part of the question is, if you agree with that, we will see how this analysis, this theory of truth made to logic determines our interpretation of natural language. And natural language is, is much more, it's much large, larger than, than that. And I would then make you, making the point that, well, we have to, this is only one aspect. It's, it's generalization is, this way of generalizing is general, generalization of endorsement. And uh, we do that because, of course, it's, we are interested in, in truth and in the objectivity, but this is not all everything we have to say about natural language. We can generalize using other uh, quantifiers, natural language quantifiers. Uh, I'm kind of criticizing that perhaps you are reducing uh, the approach and uh, we, we, uh, reducing uh, the interpretation of natural language uh, using the model of logic again. I, I don't know if, okay. I, if I made myself clear. Yes. Uh, I don't know if I'm reducing, but I'm, I'm, I'm being redu reductionist. But um, I, I don't think so. But I'm, I will try to, to give reasons. The idea is when, for instance, imagine sometimes I, I'm not going to have time to explain all these uh, uh, aspects, but Imagine that we had a bag with all possible premises or all possible theories that we can use to establish our opinions. I have a bag here. Imagine I have here the bag of premises. Among these premises, we have, for instance, I believe that basically evolutionism is true. So I can say evolutionism. Evolutionism is a set of, let's say, actions from which uh, it follow, uh, they follow all the consequences of this uh, of the Darwinian position. Imagine that we have uh, capital gamma to represent the content of evolutionism. If we want to establish some consequence of evolutionism, we can try to uh, the, draw a, a proof, something like that, and I can say, okay, let's begin with the axioms. If I take the content from the bag of possible premises, here I'm not asserting evolutionism. I assert evolutionism when I put it here as a premise. And then I draw some conclusion, for instance, alpha. I can do that without using the notion of truth, but not in natural languages. Imagine that I want to, to, to that, that I want to uh, to convince you of some of uh, of some consequence of uh, Darwinism, and I say, okay, let's agree or uh, in our uh, point of departure, and let's say, okay, imagine or let's assume that 
Darwinism, or let us assume that uh, evolutionism, what? Let us assume what? We have to say, let us assume that evolutionism is true. What does it mean? Nothing but evolutionism. But the only way in which I can assert evolutionism is by an act of assertion. An act, an act of assertion requires a complete sentence. I cannot say evolutionism. Evolutionism is the content, which doesn't, ha doesn't have any particular status. Contents are, not, are neither sentences, nor uh, uh, names, nothing. I don't know what, what content are. Um, sorry, contents are. But if I want to begin by assuming some kind of content, general content, because I can't, if I say Darwinism or evolutionism, I'm not just endorsing a singular proposition, but a whole pack. So the only way in which I can do this, and this is saying, okay, let's assume that Darwinism is true. Does it mean that Darwinism represents, I don't know what, in the world? Not at all. I'm just saying, let's consider that Darwinism is one of our premises. I'm asserting the content of the, of the theory. How would you make a difference between, let's use your example. Uh, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, everything that Pope Francis says is beautiful. Mm -hmm. So, I'm uh, quantifying over the content of everything that Pope Francis said. And what you are saying is that I could also quantify over this whole thing, the whole thing. Everything that Pope Francis said is beautiful, is true. But what would be the difference between... What is, I mean, uh, is, it equal, is it equal for... When I assert, when I assert it's beautiful, uh, I'm, I'm doing exactly the job you think that it should do is No, no. I, I, I mean, so wait a minute. I can't say... This is myself with this. No, no, you are not. I mean, <laughs> if I say everything the Pope uh, uh, Francis says is beautiful, I'm using a pro sentence, everything he says. Everything he says is a general pro sentence. And I, what I'm doing with this uh, general pro sentence is uh, uh, showing you a, a, a general content. And what I'm doing with it, with this content, is characterizing it as beautiful. Everything uh, the uh, Pope says is beautiful, although false. There's no contradiction. So I'm using pro sentences to pack in a manageable way an infinite content, a, a, a potentially infinite content, which is everything, sorry, everything the Pope says. I don't know what, is, uh, what is go uh, he is going to say. But if I say it's beautiful, I'm not endorsing his content. I'm say, I can't say everything he says is beautiful, although false. I'm not getting committed to his act of assertions. If I say everything he says is true, I'm doing two things. First, I'm packing together a virtually infinite content and endorsing it. I can endorse it without using the notion of truth, yes. I can say everything the Pope says is a fact. Well, but that would be only uh, Exactly. Yeah, but this is my point. But you can do, but you can perform similar acts without endorsing the content. What I mean is that I, I said yesterday, truth is not one in a kind. So we have different. For instance, it's beautiful. I said that the the medieval transcend, transcendentals had the same kind of of uh, concept, uh, unum verum bonum. They work in the same, more or less the same way, 
from a semantic point of view. But the, the kind of act that we perform by using them is different. And this kind of act is part of their meaning. So endorsing is something that we do using the truth apparatus. But it's not something that we do using the beautiful apparatus. That can be explained to me because you, you uh, it's, it's exactly you point to the to the, uh, to the direction I, I I criticize the approach, which is kind of to reduce everything to to ascription. Uh, what I say, what everything, what everything is, every uh, generalization could be. By, at the end of the day, be reduced to a generalization made by uh, using is true. When he says, everything that Pope Francis says, says it's beautiful, it's not endorsement. It's not endorsement. It's, uh, I, I'm not committing any, any contradiction. I'm not contradicting myself if I, if I say, it's beautiful but false. And she's practically but I don't endorse it. Yeah? But what I mean is... Now you're assuming that is Well, it's rejecting. False is rejecting. So what I'm saying... Exactly. So, I mean, yeah, yeah, you are right. But when I think of uh, true and false as, uh, I mean, two poles of the dichotomy. So what I mean is that we need means of packing... Uh, uh, contents together, and we use per sentences. I'm packing this content in beautiful. Yeah. The way you have. You are not packing. You are characterizing. I mean, you are not packing. You when you pack the content by saying everything the Pope says. If you so you are packing in this part. Everything the Pope the Pope says is the package. And then, I want to do something with it. For instance, saying that is absurd, or beautiful, or funny, or true. If I say it is true, I'm endorsing the whole pack. But I say, if I say it's funny, I'm not endorsing anything. I'm characterizing the pack in some way. Okay? Well, I don't know. So, sorry. <laughs> so, because the way you have to prove that the sentence, what Paul Frank said, is uh, has little to do with a proof to me that what he's saying is not beautiful. Because, of course, when I say it's beautiful, then of course you are right about using beautiful uh, bonum, un bonum, uh, verum. verum. Uh, because this is, uh, I could say everything Pope Francis says is good. And of course, I'm endorsing it, and I'm endorsing it in a sense which is if you say not good, with, with the, 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 the way Pope Francis describes the word, the, the, the word, but in the moral sense. So I'm clearly endorsing. You are not. So uh, listen, uh, I mean, if you say good, or well, of course, good has a positive uh, valence, of course. But imagine that I say, okay, everything the Pope says is good for your happiness or is uh, good for your life. You better behave in the way he says because everything he says is interesting or is good, even though it is false. There is no contradiction. Okay? So uh, what I'm saying is truth, the truth apparatus, in Frege and in Frege, in Frege's Begrischrift is this, full stop. This is this. what I have just said is that, that. This is the uh, symbol that in Begrischrift represents truth. And, and I agree with you, the, the critic is, this is a kind of reductionist, this is very good it fits very well to the language of logic. Logic is interested in knowledge, in, in, in truth. It, this is the, but in natural language, 
when we think now, how could we think, let's say, to your, your position, pragmatism? Uh, what happens in, 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 in language, in natural language? Uh, and, and I think Pedro was aware of that and said, this is not of our interest. We are interested in other things because we are interested in the language of, of science. But in natural language, it's not, uh, not everything is about the truth. But about the truth, truth does, doesn't mean anything but those contents, those contents to which I get committed. <coughs> In natural languages, our our real uh, communicative exchanges are very much about our responsibility related to the content of our assertive acts. Exactly. And, and this is what truth uh, signals. And this is the critic because I can, it's, I'm committed to what friends, both friends said morally, although I can accept that, well, whatever, He's saying, or what he's saying, then you, is, is, or, or, in, in fact, it doesn't matter if it's true or false. Probably. It, 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 and it, if it doesn't matter, you shouldn't use the term truth. And I'm not using, I'm using Perfect. it's good. Okay. So it's not that I, I believe it's true, and that's why I'm following, thinking it is good. No, I'm endorsing it as a good, as good, as. So, so you are you are pointing at uh, different kinds of endorsement. Yes, but, I'm, it's okay, it's, it's okay. It's, it's it's, okay, but uh, truth is a way of expressing approval. It's, but you are right; it is not the only way. But it's the only way when we want to draw conclusions in a valid, in a valid way. Okay, so we, I mean, we agree, more or less. In this, but. <laughs> you said that it's reduction. <coughs> no, no. Well, okay, maybe I am, but I don't think so. I don't think so. I think that uh, well, you have uh, mentioned the, no the notion of proof. I can't prove. I don't uh, have justification. And truth has, in, has nothing to do with proof. So uh, I'm not talking about uh, this epistemological issue. My endorsement is something that has to do with our commitment. And our rational behavior. Nothing else. Truth has nothing to do with truth. Truth is not part of the argument. Yeah, well, uh, proof is what. Uh, you said it's part of the. What part of truth is? That it's there in the. In the Truth is the movement that takes something here and put it as a premise. And truth. So uh, I, what I have said is here I don't need to say it's true because we have a different kind of language. But in natural language, the only way in which I can represent or mimic this kind of uh, uh, behavior is saying, okay, let's assume that evolutionism is true. So I'm just asserting the whole pack package. Hmm? Okay. No. No, in logic, it's okay. We can put this aside. What we're saying is, of course, when we have this, this, this schema, 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 the schema of the argument. So, uh, in the schema, in, in, in this is good because we can be neutral about the premises. But in natural language, it's, it's not possible. So, it's always about, and you are right about that, it's always about some kind of endorsement. And my point is, we have endorsement in terms of descriptions, and this is where truth is important. But we have all we have all the kinds of endorsement. I agree. And they are generalizations as well. And uh, you cannot prove you, you cannot uh, argue against the all kind of generalizations by saying that my description of the world is wrong. So it's it, it's about a kind of different kind of endorsement. But this is endorsement. Of course, I agree with you. It's but not in a sense. I I agree with you. The only point is that truth 
has nothing to do with a description of the wood. Yesterday, oh, yes, and uh, I w we will discuss it tomorrow. So the idea is, this is the, the point which is uh, uh, putting an obstacle in our understanding. Truth has nothing to do with description of the world. I will ex explain it when I explain tomorrow uh, expressivism. Okay? Uh, today, Your topic. Today, today afternoon. You will, I mean, I, I, I will. Uh, I I I had I mean I had the idea of uh, uh, talking about the liar paradox, but I don't have any problems in ex explaining expressivism. <laughs> instead, right. expressivism. Okay, okay, yes, and so I will I will explain expressivism now, and you are going to miss it. No, I will say for the first hour. So <laughs> let's talk now. Yeah. <laughs> yes, in order to come okay. back at, at one o'clock. Uh, no, one thirty. One thirty. One thirty. Okay. Yes. So, thank you for that. Thank you. <laughs> 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 no, 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 no,